Welcome, dear friends. Welcome to our spiritual home, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tarpon Springs. My name is Judy Pickett, and I serve on the Board of Trustees. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with short salt and pepper hair, mostly salt. I have blue eyes, and I'm way too short for my weight. We want to acknowledge that here at the church, we are in the lands of the Tokabaga and Seminole peoples. We're a church of many welcomes, and we offer a warm welcome to all of you. This is a liberal community for all ages, promoting spiritual growth, social justice, and the arts. This is a very active church, and everyone is invited to participate in any of our activities. And it's so nice to see more activities to participate in, isn't it? To learn more about events, our church calendar is on the website, and you can talk with us during coffee hour, and we'll, we'll share a little bit more of what's going on and make some friends. Our children and youth are here with us in the beginning of the service, and we have faith formation programming available with our gifted leaders, Jamie and Anna. There's Anna. Jamie's got the day off, I guess. Children gather for their time together with them after the story. If you'd like more information about our programming, please contact Reverend Christina or see Jamie or Anna after the service. For those of you in the building, we have connection cards available in the pews near the hymnal. If you are um, new to us or you're visiting us for the first time and want to find out more about us, please fill one of these out and put it in the plate when it goes around. Ignore this thing, it don't work no more. We have to put a new one in there, so. You got one, right? Okay. And let's see, the other thing we have are these little cards. During joys and concerns, if you would like to write down a concern or a joy that you would like me to read, rather than you getting up and saying it, put, fill out one of these cards and put it in the collection plate. If you're watching us on Zoom or on YouTube, you can send us an email at membershipuutarpin.org to get connected. And there are also small cards. Thank you. We're delighted to have Reverend Christina leading the surface today. Music is provided by our, our music director, Bonnie Whitehurst, and our choir. Again, welcome. We will now sing hymn number 42 in the gray hymnal, Morning So Fair to See. Morning so fair 
Spouty. I am the Reverend Christina Spouty. I use she, her pronouns and am a white woman. I have chin length, curly brown hair parted on one side with blue eyes. Our opening words this morning come from Julian Jamaica Ninan Soto, published under the name of Teresa I. Soto from their work, Spilling the Light. This is the spark between. There must be fuel, there must be a spark, and there must be oxygen. We have principles and ethics the fuel of the fire we would light. The spark is what passes between us, along with our aliveness, our possibility. Spirit moving in us is our clear invitation, embossed, addressed, sealed with wax, tied with ribbon. The spark is a seed of fire that must be treasured and tended that it may bring the light. We have passion, the air without which nothing thrives, least of all the blaze of covenant, justice, and kindness we would illuminate, both with who we are and what we do. All of these an invitation to bring to life the blaze of liberation that is meant to light our way and to dispel the fog of cruelty and grief. It brings us instead to a hearth around which we gather to be nourished, energized, and warmed, and where we get ready to disperse, enlivened. Come, let us worship together. We light our chalice with these words from Ellen Hamilton. In faith, together, we light this small scrap of light, symbol of Grandfather Sun's enormous power, whose energy burns so brightly in these deep days of summer, catapulting the leaves and the vines, vegetables, flowers, and fruits to astonishing size, lengths, and heights spilling over the top of cages, walls, and trellises, delighting and nourishing all beings. We bask in the warmth and the heat of these days with lightened hearts and quickened senses, in gratitude and in faith. And let us sing together hymn number 123 in the Gray Book, Spirit of Life.
Our story today is abridged. It's titled Miss Rumphius. The story and pictures are by Barbara Cooney. The Lupin lady lives in a small house overlooking the sea. In between the rocks around her house grow blue and purple and rose-colored flowers. The Lupin lady is little and old, but she was not always that way. I know. She is my great aunt, and she told me so. Once upon a time, she was a little girl named Alice who lived in a city by the sea. Many years ago, her grandfather had come to America on a large sailing ship. Now he worked in the shop at the bottom of the house, making figureheads for the prows of ships and painting sailing ships and places across the sea. When he was busy, Alice helped him put in the skies. In the evening, Alice sat on her grandfather's knee and listened to his stories of far away places. When he had finished, Alice would say, when I grow up, I too will go to far away places. And when I grow old, I too will live by the sea. That is all very well, little Alice, said her grandfather. But there is a third thing that you must do. You must find a way to make the world more beautiful. All right, said Alice, but she did not know what that could be. And pretty soon she was grown up. Then my great aunt Alice set out to do the three things that she had told her grandfather she was going to do. She left home and went to live in another city far from the sea and the salt air. There she worked in a library, dusting books and keeping them from getting mixed up and helping people find the ones they wanted. Some of those books told her about faraway places. People called her Miss Rumphius now. Sometimes she went to the conservatory in the middle of the park. When she stepped inside on a wintry day, the warm, moist air wrapped itself around her and the sweet smell of jasmine filled her nose. This is almost like a tropical isle, said Miss Rumphius, but not quite. So Miss Rumphius went to a real tropical island where people kept cockatoos and monkeys as pets. She walked on long beaches, picking up beautiful shells. My great aunt, Miss Alice Rumphius, climbed tall mountains where the snow never melted she went through jungles and across deserts, and everywhere she made friends she would never forget. Finally, she came to the land of the Lotus Eaters, and there, getting off a camel, she hurt her back. What a foolish thing to do, said Miss Rumphius. Well, I certainly have been far away places. Maybe it is time to find my place by the sea. And it was, so she did. From the porch of her new house, Miss Rumphius watched the sun come up. She watched it cross the heavens and sparkle on the water, and she saw it set in glory in the evening. She started a little garden among the rocks, and she planted a few flower seeds in the stony ground. Miss Rumphius was almost perfectly happy. But there is still one more thing I have to do, she said. I have to do something to make the world more beautiful. But what? The world is already pretty nice, she thought, looking out over the ocean. The next spring, Miss Rumphius was not very well. Her back was bothering her again, and she had to stay in bed most of the time. The flowers she had planted the summer before had come up and bloomed in spite of the stony ground. 
She could see them from her bedroom window, blue and purple and rose-colored. Lupins, said Miss Rumpheus. I have always loved lupins best. I wish I could plant more seeds this summer so I could have still more flowers next year. But she was not able to. After a hard winter, spring came. Miss Rumpheus was feeling much better. She could take walks again. One afternoon, she started to go up over the hill where she had not been in a long time. I don't believe my eyes, she cried as she got to the top. For there, on the other side of the hill, was a large patch of blue and purple and rose-colored lupins. It was the wind, she said as she knelt in delight. It was the wind that brought the seeds from my garden here. And then Miss Rumpheus had a wonderful idea. She hurried home and sent off to the very best seed house for five bushels of lupin seed. All that summer, Miss Rumpheus, her pockets full of seeds, wandered over fields and headlands, sowing lupins. She scattered seeds along the highways and down country lanes. She flung handfuls of them around the schoolhouse and the back of the church. She tossed them in hollows and along stone walls. Her back didn't hurt anymore at all. Now, some people called her that crazy old lady. The next spring, there were lupins everywhere. Fields and hillsides were covered with blue and purple and rose-colored flowers. They bloomed along the highways and down the lanes. Bright patches lay around the schoolhouse and back of the church. Down in the hollows and along stone walls grew the beautiful flowers. Miss Rumpheus had done the third, the most difficult thing of all. My great aunt Alice, Miss Rumpheus, is very old now. Her hair is very white. Every year there are more and more lupins. Now they call her the lupin lady. Sometimes my friends stand with me outside her gate, curious to see the old, old lady who planted the fields of lupins. When she invites us in, they come slowly. They think she is the oldest woman in the world. Often she tells us stories of faraway places. When I grow up, I tell her, I too will go faraway places and come home to live by the sea. That is all very well, little Alice, says my aunt. But there is a third thing you must do. You must do something to make the world more beautiful. All right, I say, but I do not know yet what that could be. And though we have no children or youth with us somehow this morning in our building, we are still going to sing hymn number 413, Go Now in Peace, because it is important to practice. <laughs> we're getting that song down pretty well. I love it. There's a, I learned it in um, sign language at one time. I've forgotten some of it, but I know Barbara Rosen 
didn't you and Diana do, do this in sign language? Spirit of oh, Life. Oh, Spirit of Life. I did go now in peace. Okay, whatever. Now is a time in our service where we take our offering for which, for the work and welfare of this church. Ours is a free faith which must sustain itself financially. You can go to our website, uutarpin.org, and click on the donate button, or you may mail your offering to the church at 57 Reed Street, Tarpon Strings, 34689. For those of you with us in person in the sanctuary, place your offering in the offering plates as they are passed. The offering will now be given and received. Maybe. Who's going to do it? Oh, you want the music? Okay. <laughs> Wrong direction, sorry. reading, we will take a brief moment of silence to allow you to settle into yourselves and your seat. Take a few deep breaths, if you are able, deep into your belly.
Our reading today is A Conversation Amongst the Flowers by Reverend Kate Wilkinson. One day, two children stood side by side looking at the garden, which was in full bloom. Isn't it pretty, said the first child, with all the different colors? I don't see color, said the second child, for this is what their parents had taught them to say. This started up quite a conversation amongst the flowers who spoke their own quiet language with each other. That makes me want to cry, said the bleeding heart, who was full of feeling on the best of days. You always want to cry, said the iris, who was always self-possessed, never shedding petals here and there like the apple blossoms which grew above her. But it's so sad, the bleeding heart repeated, not to see color. Don't worry, said the flag, upright and direct as always. They're just pretending anyway when they say that. But why would they say such a thing, asked the peony indignantly. It would be such a shame not to see my beautiful magenta layers. Of all the flowers in the garden, she was the most showy. <laughs> because they were taught the wrong thing about this country when they got here, said the flag, who often spoke about the country's founding. They were told that this place was a melting pot, that everyone should be the same. The sweet grass, who had been there long before, swayed gently in the breeze and added, they didn't understand that this land is a garden, that we each add a beauty with our different colors and shapes and sizes. Well, I certainly do, said the peony, ever confident. They forget, said the lupin, that we bloom in our own way and in different seasons to make the world more beautiful. But will they remember, asked the nervous forget-me-not, always preoccupied with the questions of legacy. That's why we're here, remarked the daisy, who, though humble, knew the power of a simple gesture, having once been placed into the barrel of a gun to proclaim a peace. That's why we're here, to remind them. Amen. 
The Florida legislative session came to a close on Friday. It is amazing to me how much gets accomplished or perhaps destroyed in eight weeks in a year. Republicans overwhelmingly seat both the Florida Senate and the House, and obviously the governor is also. Some headlines from this session. DeSantis is suing Disney, who is countersuing, and DeSantis is countersuing the countersue. DeSantis has been granted the ability to run for President of the United States while remaining governor of Florida. School vouchers have been expanded to be available for every child, which is likely going to be at the cost of public schools. Concealed weapon carrying has been expanded with permitless carrying. We are one year post news being leaked that Roe would be overturned, and now Florida has made it so abortions have been banned after six weeks, with rare exceptions, along with other limitations. Juries may recommend the death penalty or life sentence when two-thirds of the jury agree it should be imposed, along with other related sentencing requirements. Voting laws have been made more strict and limit the ability of third-party voter organizations to work, while also making it more difficult for first-time voters to vote in ways that especially impact black and other people of color voters like Latin folks. It is harder to sue insurers. Now, businesses and hospitals will have stronger requirements to check and collect data on immigrants who are in Florida illegally. State universities will be barred from maintaining programs that encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion. Both houses voted to ban minors from receiving gender-affirming care and ban state-funded coverage for transgender care. Both voted to prohibit licenses or permits and spelled out consequences for any establishment that admits a child to an adult performance. This is the bill that prevents minors from experiencing a drag show or possibly even pride events. Other bills on the table include one that makes it easier to block local ordinances and gives more power to the state in determining if an ordinance is arbitrary and unreasonable, <coughs> while rewarding up to $50,000 in attorney's fees. One to dictate which restroom and changing facilities, domestic violence center, correctional institution you can use based on your gender assigned at birth. Define sex, that is gender, for children. One that restricts sexuality education before ninth grade and provides the foundation for support of parental requests for book bans. This is just this year. If you wonder why you're tired, it's because living in Florida is exhausting as liberal and progressive people. Honestly, I'm fairly certain that isn't everything that happened this session, but I had to stop reading. It literally wears at our spirits, our minds, our hearts, and our bodies. German Lutheran pastor Martin Niemöller was in the 1920s and early 1930s a supporter of Nazi ideas and supported radical white right wing, white wing probably is about right too, movements. That is until Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933. Then Niemöller became an outspoken opponent of Hitler's, criticizing his interference in the Protestant church. 
It's interesting how people's viewpoints change when they are suddenly personally impacted. It is Niemöller's words that have been immortalized to remind us of the lesson he finally learned. He said, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. We think that World War II was a long time ago, but it's only been about three generations. The lessons we learned, it seems, we are needing to relearn. All through April, April, we reflected together on the theme of resistance. We considered the many forms resistance can take, from survival to mass movements of protest, making art and being neighborly, starting organizations and teaching our children and youth, among others. We talk about banned books and other media, advocate for sexuality education for people of all ages, practice values that have led Unitarian Universalists in now hallmark golden shirts to be coined the love people in some communities where we have shown up at their request, amplifying cries for justice in communities where they otherwise have not been consistently heard, using the power and privilege of our commitment to true justice for those marginalized and oppressed. Here in Florida, of course, our voices are the marginalized ones. Whereas the Florida legislature holds a supermajority, we are a super minority, or at least it certainly looks that way in this gerrymandered in favor of right-wingers and Republican state, which is making its way to fascism. I never thought a day would come in this country that I'd have to say in sincerity that fascism is bad, and yet here we are. For anyone here today, you've probably noticed that I like to play with language, words and phrases when I write service titles and do other work. One play or reference for today is the term flower power, which was coined in 1965 by beat poet Allen Ginsberg in Berkeley. Ginsburg wanted to transform war protests into spectacles advocating for peace and nonviolence. The iconic picture of a young man putting a daisy in a gun barrel emerged from this idea. Although the term predates me having graduated from Kent State University, where four students were killed by Ohio National Guards, the 53rd anniversary of which was just late last week. And having lived in Kent for 20 years, the stories of that era have sunk into my muscles and bones. Places and communities hold memories that are also carried generation to generation. And while the liberals and the hippies were protesting the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 70s by making love and not war, the Republicans and right-wing politicians, strategists and fundamentalists were plotting a longer-term strategy. Once implemented, they knew it would take about two generations to have the traction they expected, but they were ready to wait it out the outcome would be worth it. Margaret Atwood, Octavia Butler, and other authors and observers knew what was coming. That's why Atwood wrote The Handmaid's Tale, published in 1985, and Butler wrote much, but especially the Parable series, which was published in the 1990s. 
What we are seeing in the political landscape is the fruits of those carefully laid out plans and dreams, a right-wing takeover of our democratic republic. Germany also didn't become a dictatorship overnight. If you're a history nerd like me, you know that Germany wasn't a nation state until 1870 when all the parts of Germany and Prussia unified in a war against France. Prussia and the German Confederation had long had a strong seat of power in Europe and finally being called into one body altered the balance of power in Europe. Western Europe remained relatively stable until the Great War in 1914. That same year, a Baptist pastor and church planter named Norbert Chopek fled Europe for the United States. His views were too liberal for the German authorities, and it was not safe for Chopek, his wife, and their eight children to stay. During his time in the United States, Chopek resigned as a Baptist minister as he continued to become more liberal and after his first wife died, he met and married his second wife, Maya. Together, they found the Unitarian Church, which they were impressed by and their children loved. At the end of 1921, they decided to return to their newly formed homeland of Czechoslovakia as they felt called both to help rebuild their country and to spread the good news of our faith one that Chopik had adopted and became a Unitarian minister. Chopik founded a church in Prague that grew quickly. Czechoslovakia, like much of Western Europe, was deeply devastated by the war. People didn't have enough to eat, clothing to wear or to replace what they had. Families were displaced. The landscape was devastated. Many people left the Catholic Church, which was most common there, and Chopik transformed the look and feel of his new congregation to make it even more distinct. No robes or vestments, long, long sermons that people connected with, and different music. While people connected with the faith itself, they were not as connected with each other. In a place and time still so marked by the hardships of war and struggle, he wanted to create a ritual that would give them meaning and beauty and hope. He had an idea. Each person was asked to bring a flower or budding branch with them to church the following Sunday. The service was about a number of ideas related to the flowers, their unique beauty, how they differed from each other in shape, size, color, and kind, and the wonderful image they created when brought together. This was in 1923 when the Chopics hosted the first flower festival. Reverend Dr. Chopic then made comparisons between the flowers and the people reminding each of them of their inherent worth and dignity, their beauty, the power they create and share when together. Each year, he consecrated the bouquets they created together. One blessing that he shared is, Infinite Spirit of life, we ask thy blessing on these, thy messengers of fellowship and love. May they remind us, amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts, to be one in desire and affection and devotion to thy holy will. May they also remind us of the value of comradeship, of doing and sharing alike. May we cherish a friendship as one of thy most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of each other's talents discourage us or sully our relationship, but may we realize that whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do thy work 
in this world. The flower ceremony became a ritual of togetherness and hope, and one that brought the community closer together to each other in a way that they had previously been unable to be. The church flourished. In 20 years, it had about 3,200 members. Also in that 20 years, though Chapek's church was growing, Europe had entered another great war. Maya, who had long since become Reverend Maya, came back to the U.S. in 1939 to fundraise for relief efforts at home by going on a speaking tour. Things worsened such that she wasn't able to return home during the war. She decided to do what she could while she was here and became the minister of the New Bedford, Massachusetts congregation, where she served from 1940 until 1943. During her tour and her ministry, she shared the flower ceremony that her husband had created. It has become a widely celebrated ritual throughout Unitarian Universalism and remains the best known uniquely Unitarian Universalist celebration. Reverend Norbert made the decision to stay home this time when the war broke out. He felt called to remain with his people. In 1941, along with one of his daughters, he was arrested by the Gestapo, and his books, sermons, and other writings were confiscated. He was charged with listening to foreign radio broadcasts, which was a capital offense, and other crimes. But of course, it was his heretical liberal theology that led him to be convicted. Ever a minister, he continued to support others in the camps, inspiring hope and an inner strength and peace through his quiet presence. Chapek even led at least one flower ceremony in the camps, while made of what scraps of nature could be found in the cracks and the grounds. He spent about a year and a half imprisoned in the concentration camps where he was tortured and finally gassed to death in Dachau in late 1942. Reverend Maya learned of his death only after the war ended. The Flower Festival can seem a meaningless or self-serving ritual without this history. American individualism and consumerism tell us that, of course, we are unique and wonderful and special. There's no shortage of opportunities for us to get that message. I mean, as long as you fit the dominant culture norms. The melting pot being still held as some American dream. You're special as long as you conform. But what Chapek showed us 100 years ago is the real truth, that we are, each of us, in every way, we are beautiful. Our colors and hues, our expressions, our sizes and shapes, the ways our bodies move and sound, all of it is magic. And we are blessings and wonders all on our own. We shine and bless the world as we are. And when we come together, when we stand and sit and rock and roll together, we are even more beautiful. Together, we can craft a deeper wholeness we cannot find alone. Together, we craft a power we cannot find alone. Together, we are better. We need each other, and we belong to each other in the most profound ways. Chapek's life and work was never meant to be the center of the flower ceremony, but with this being the 100-year anniversary and the state of the state, of the country, of the world, 
it seems as important as ever to remember his faithful legacy. Like Miss Rumphius, he sought to make and leave the world a more beautiful place than the one he was born into. Chopik held his beliefs, even knowing what his future would be for doing so. Like the flowers in our reading, he worked to remind us all of our beauty and enoughness. Like both the story and the reading, he reminded us of the power we have as individuals and as a community to help create hope and a greater good. May the flowers always remind us of all that is good and true. May we honor lives of service to others and to our shared faith and remember to hold and celebrate and build with each other. May we live into the radical possibilities of our faith and know both its strength and our failures. May our values ground us and our creativity bolster us to give us the strength and courage to live our lives as fully as we can in the time we have, as Reverend Chopik did in his life. If you would please rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing our closing hymn, number 305, in the gray hymnal, De Colores.
you haven't yet, please take a moment to take in the beauty of this stunning arrangement of abundant flowers that we have received this morning. And at the end of the service, please take a flower with you that is one that you did not bring. And our closing words today come from Jean Harrison Newyar, who has written in The Gift of Faith. In the lore of ancient China, there's a story of a philosopher who was asked, where is the road called hope? He replied, it does not exist, but as people move upon it, it comes into being. I invite you to continue moving forward on this road, this path, this journey called hope with me. Nope, we're singing. We're singing. We're singing. We're singing. <laughs> we're singing. We're singing. You decided to come back. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Listen to what the And you all know that's a song by Spinal Tap. Spinal Tap is not a band, it's a movie, and they wrote that song for the movie. And this lady over here found it for us, so. It's kind of fun. Now, we're going to do the chalice extinguishing. We hope that you found meaning in today's service. And we close with these words from Melissa Jeter. We extinguish this chalice today, but we are illuminated by a faith that allows us to sit and think. In this quiet time, we can reflect in solitude, meditate in on love, and growing out of comfort. Though we experience discomfort, we are excited to give birth to the new, just world. <laughs>